what that is is we are making a safe place for pastors, ministers, uh, the body to come so we can uh, unite them, bring them together. And our whole goal, our whole vision is for unity in the church. Because right now there's not a lot of unity going on. Right now there's, you know, people are, are, are you know, they see someone that, you know, they wear their hair a certain way, they wear, they're wearing makeup, oh, can't do that, you know. I like makeup, wear a lot of makeup. But, uh, Thanks, thank God for the makeup. Yeah, exactly right. Glory, so, hallelujah. Listen, our, our, our main focus should be Jesus. This, this is all about Jesus. Yes, yes. You know, thinking about what Jesus did for us. I mean, I could, every night I could come up here and talk about what Jesus did for us. because that's what, And that's what we're doing. I want you to remember tonight, we're not focusing on evil or, or demons. We're not focusing on that. But what our, our mission is, our goal is, is to go over the foundational teachings and not, and not just assume people know all these things. Even if you've been to Bible college, mm. even if you've been preaching for 40 years, it doesn't matter. The thing is, you need to know the basic foundational things. And you know what? Go back and revisit them every once in a while. Amen. And that's why we want pastors here. That's why we want ministers here. That's why we want the body here. Because if you know it, great. We'll reinforce it. Right. If you don't know it, guess what? We've got something new for you. And as always, I want to, to remind you that I'm not trying to step on someone's theology. Okay? If, if your theology is different than ours and what we're saying here is not to hurt you, put you down, or offend you. There's no offense in this room. Amen. So if you have a question about something we're talking about, you know, because all of us here, this, this is my family right here. Yes. Amen. Amen, brother. This is my family. Yes. And it doesn't stop at these walls. Come on. So, and this is the way that God has really been talking to me for the past three months. And this week, he has downloaded so much into me this week. I couldn't, I, I was writing, taking notes, trying my best to keep up, and I couldn't. I said, I have to take a break. I need to go take a shower. <laughs> Went and got in the shower, and he kept going. Talking. And so I yelled at Rebecca. I said, Beck, can you text this to me so I'll remember it later? While I'm in the shower, and bless her heart, she was trying to fix it. <laughs> and I'll give you what the bottom line was. The bottom line is he's saying, listen. And, and, and I posted this on Facebook. A lot of you probably saw this. He told me, he said, I'm sending you pastors. And I said, good, I can go. And he goes, no, no. I said, I'm sending them. And that's something we have got to watch out for. If I start trying to make that happen, guess what? Right. I'm really going to mess it up. Right. Mm -hmm. So he, he said, I'm sending you pastors. Now, here's the thing. Now, pastors have to hear the Holy Spirit as well as I hear the Holy Spirit as well as you hear the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And pastors have a tough job. Yes. They really do. They've got this flock. And they've got to wrap their arms around that flock. And they've got to love them. They've got to equip them. Right? Yes. So the Lord was telling me that he does not want any more one-fold ministries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm sitting here downloading. He said, I have made you a filament between these pastors for unity. And I said, filament? I don't even, I've never used that word in a million years. And I looked it up and it says it's a string or a wire that connects. That the more you heat it up, the brighter it shines. And has a high melting point. So, I don't know how to read into that. I don't know if I want to read into that. But. So, we want this to be a safe haven, a safe place for pastors to come, ministers to come, the body to come, because we want to be unified. And this isn't someone saying, I know more than you, I know better. No, it's not that. It's saying, the Holy Spirit talks to me differently than he talks to you because your gifts are different. That's right. Your strengths are different. That's right. And so when he's telling me something, it's going to be in line with the word. Yes. And that's what we're going to do is we're going to stick to the word. And so our whole goal, our whole vision is to unite and to bless. And those pastors that are here tonight, you know, uh, Pastor Jerry, where are you at? Yes. Heard it right over there. Thank you yes. for coming all this way. We sure love you guys. Met this guy you know, instantly. Connected. Just right here. I, I can't say it any other way. Amen. I just felt the love coming Amen. off this guy. And you have to get connected. Don't, you have a youth ministry, is that correct? You have, so get with this guy tonight. Another reason we do this is we want you guys to get to know each other. How are we going to have unification if you don't talk to each other? Amen. So that's what we want. That's what our goal is. So before we start in with tonight's message, I want to share something with you that I didn't understand when it happened.
but I understand a lot more clearly now. Um, went, went on a mission trip to help out to Scotland. Where's our Scotland people? There we go. Here, here, here. Lord. So went to Scotland, and during uh, there's a little town called Moffat. We went to Moffat. There was a little place where they fed us dinner, and um, we were doing praise and worship. Probably maybe eight to ten people were there, women that made a dinner for us. It was awesome. Amen. So we're in praise and worship, and I just close my eyes and start praying, and instantly... I'm in the presence of, of Jesus. I'm standing on a hill. And this is happening while praise and worship is going on. So I'm standing on a hill overlooking a valley. And next to me is Jesus. And he's not wearing purple and a crown and any of that. He's standing next to me wearing just a white, what, just a white robe. And I, I looked and I said, I said, Lord, I said, what are we doing here? And he points down to the valley. And in the valley beneath us, there are lines, almost like, you know, when someone plows a field. There's different lines of things. And on each line, there was someone pushing a plow down each line. And each row was a different size. A few of them were very short. Some of them were very long, almost as far as I could see. And they were pushing these plows. And I said, Lord, I said, I don't understand. What am I looking at? And he said, those are ministers. Those are pastors. And as I looked, I looked down, and the ones with the short rows, they would push this plow, and they'd come up. There was a black fence in front of them on the road. And they would get to this fence, and they would stop, and they would look at it, and they would turn around and go the other way. And each one of them had a bag and with brightly glowing seeds. I remember this. It was on their back. And they would put these seeds down behind them as they were plowing this field. And so I, I looked at it, and I didn't say anything. It was all in my mind. I said, Lord, I don't understand why they're, you know, and he, and he, and he just said, watch. And so the long rows that they had, someone came up to this fence. It was a pastor pushing his plow. He came up to the fence, and he looked at it, and he nudged it, and it just collapsed. It just disintegrated, and he kept going. Mm -hmm. And he kept going. And his, he planted that seed and kept going and kept going and kept going. And as I looked over to the Lord, behind him was this building, and it was full of seeds. It was just completely full of seeds, just waiting to be planted. And I'll never forget, I said, Lord, why are they stopping? And he said, they just don't realize the authority, the power that they have. Amen. And then I noticed they had a ball and chain around their ankle. And I said, what's the ball and chain for? And he you know, said, watch. And when I looked down, one of the pastors stopped and looked at his foot and saw it. And he lifted his foot out of it and stepped around it and kept going. He said, they don't realize those chains have already been broken. Mm -hmm. Glory. Yes. And so I kind of, whatever you want to call it, came to, woke up, still in praise and worship. And I think I shared it that night, but I really didn't understand what I was seeing. But now, two days later, or two days ago, Rebecca and I were sitting there and we were doing praise and worship. And, he, and the Lord told me, he goes, you remember what I showed you? He says, now is the time that, that needs to be shared. So you pastors, you ministers, you body of Christ, you can have little fences come up in front of you, but guess what? You've got authority in you. You've got power in you. You've got Jesus Christ on your side. Who, listen, how can we lose? How can we fail? The only way we can lose, the only way we can fail is if we stop and turn around. So that vision wasn't for me. It was for you. For anyone that can hear me right now, this is what he's saying. He's going to keep going. Press Amen. through. Amen. I'm right behind you. And we've got all this seed behind us that we're planting as pastors, as ministers, as the body. So much seed. And we don't have a lot of time. So I just wanted to share that with you. So our mission, our goal at, at Saturday Sanctuary here is to unify pastors, ministers, the body. There's a revival coming, and everyone knows this. So we need to unify to prepare because, you know, if, if we're living in a country where killing babies is okay in a lot of places. That's not okay. So we need to push through those fences, and we need to let our voices be heard. Amen? Amen. All right. And as far as uh, some back, if you, if you think I'm just, you know, I'm talking about the one-fold ministry, the five-fold. Read, read Ephesians 4, uh, 11 through 16. And he talks completely about that. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And I just want to say a couple things about it. Um, 
We're joined together. The whole body is joined and knit together, all five of those offices. Um, every part doesn't share. I'm just taking little pieces of it. Uh, it causes growth for the body, edifying itself in love. So what happens if, you, if we don't have the five-fold ministry in our churches? What happens? Anybody remember that? We're tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, trickery of men, and cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. And how many of you know, and I'm not, please hear my heart on this, I'm not speaking ill of pastors or churches, but how many of you know without that, that's where the checks and balances are. That's where the accountability is. Look at David Koresh, Jim Jones, all of these guys who, who took that and spoke those words and, and, and tricked and deceived, which is actually what this verse is talking about, and, and led them to their death. So a five-fold ministry is not a bad thing. How many of you, how many of you churches have, have uh, uh, a prophet, a church prophet? How many of you have someone in the apostolic in your church come speak, whatever? All of those things start inviting that because your flock, here's the thing, you're equipping your flock, but you need to equip them in every aspect, every facet, because a lot of people don't know what their true gifting is. How many people know of a church because the pastor there is really a teacher? And he just didn't know basically what he needed to do to be a teacher, so he became a pastor. I know a lot of evangelists right now that are that. that they're our pastors because they didn't have a place to go and do their evangelism. So now they're doing both duties. So the clarity in this in these verses is that there is a specific function that you can perform together in unity and it's well rounded and it covers everybody. So I just wanted to talk about that for a little bit because that's what God has really been placing in my heart. All right. Okay. So this week we're going to talk about Christians in bondage. And uh, can spirit-filled believers be demon-possessed? Now, everything that we're going to talk about is Bible-based. If you ever hear someone teaching about something and they don't use verses to back it up, you need to be careful, all right? So this is what we're going to talk about tonight. Remember, the focus should never be on Satan or his minions. If you start getting your mind set on that, you're on, you're on the wrong mindset. It needs to be about Jesus and what he's done. But as pastors and ministers, and if you're going out witnessing to other people, you need to know the, the, the basic foundation because you're going to be asked questions like this. You're going to be um, put in situations where you may have to deal with things like this. So you need to know the basics and you cannot assume someone knows all this. OK, so we started a few weeks ago going over just the basic facts of things. And that's what we're going to continue tonight. All right. Okay, um, Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for what? Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. Now, does it, a lot of people say, are, you know, will perish or whatever, but I like this because it says they are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So our goal in meeting once a month right now is to share knowledge. Like I said, if you already know this, good, we'll reinforce it. If not, then this is where you should be taking notes. Because you're going to need this at some point. It's not a coincidence we're all here. Amen. It's not a coincidence we're all here. Now, I will tell you this. Satan does not want you to hear this message. He does not want you to hear this. He does not want you to know this. And why is that? Because he will be found out. What happens when he's found out? Anybody? Whooped. Doesn't he have to give it back how many times? Sevenfold. 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 So he does not want to hear this. So this is one of my favorite. I like saying this over as much as we can. I like spreading this because he gets found out and he has to pay back. Amen. That's, uh, that's a proverb, so I'm not making that one up. All right? John 8, 36 says, He whom the Son makes free is free indeed. So the more we learn, the more our arsenal is filled with our tools to set people free. The, the, listen, we're, we're cleaning up. We're cleaning up. Everyone in here, if you go out and you're ministering to someone that you know that's having some serious issues and problems, this is where we can make a difference in their life. Yeah. Okay? Bible-based. Yes. You take these verses and you use them. All right? 
Okay, so most believers are not free indeed because they don't believe they can indeed be free in bondage. That's where a lot of Christians are like, I'm not in bondage, I can't be in bondage, I'm saved. It's not true. Like we talked about the last time we met, there are many, many spirit of rejection, spirit of pride, all of those things. Remember when we talked about pride and everyone said, I'm glad I don't have to worry about that. So, um, so in, in John 8, 36, uh, Jesus is actually speaking to believers when he says this, because he says, he says to those Jews in verse 31 who believe in him, okay? So is it possible for a believer to be in bondage? Yes. Yes. All right. Go with me to Mark chapter 5, verse 1. Now this one is so good, we're going to read the whole thing. Uh, I, I've got some on the screen, but if you have your Bible, turn to Mark 5, verse 1. Like Karen Page's flip instead of your iPad beeping. Okay, Mark 5 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. Now, this is actually the city of Gadara. Now, some other translations say, uh, pronounce it another way, the city. I use the new, new King James Version, so if you use a different version, it might say a different type city name, but it's actually the city of Gadara. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now this is one of the ways the Bible refers to demonic spirits, unclean spirits. Who had his dwelling among the tombs, so he lives in the cemetery, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. Because he had been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. And I had a student this year in my class in my high school that would come in and had cuts all over his arm. He, I said, do you like cutting yourself? And he said, no, I really don't. I just can't seem to, to stop cutting myself. So this was a, an opening for me where I could minister to him. Um, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. Now, the Greek word here for worship is proskuneo. Now, proskuneo means prostrate on the ground, got on their face. So this guy, this with an unclean spirit, saw Jesus and ran to him and fell on his face. He cried out with a loud voice and said, now, this is, this is actually the demon talking, not the man. What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Jesus wouldn't torment a man. For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, what is your name? Now listen, he's not talking to the man, he's talking to the spirit. And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, Legion is a Roman word that's a troop of soldiers, 6,826 soldiers. 6,826, which means that this guy is saying, we are Legion, for we are many. So basically, he has more than 6,000 spirits in him. This is what most theologians believe that, that this guy is saying. So this guy basically was demonized, right? right. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now, demons like to stay where they have a stronghold. That's right. They like to stay where they have a stronghold because it is hard to get into a body unless there's an opening, a door, a window, or certain other things that we talked about last time. Now, a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once, Jesus gave them permission. And the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, so that's about at least 2,000 demons, uh, right? And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the, who fed the swine fled, told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and, and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. I think they would ask him to do a sermon or something there. Uh -oh. sitting there. Anyway. And those who saw it told him how it happened to him who had been demon possessed. Now we're gonna we're gonna define demon possessed later, all right? About the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. And how he had compassion on you. And he departed and began to pro uh, proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him. 
and all marvel. Okay, so the capitalist is not a city. The capitalist is ten cities. Okay, deca meaning ten. Cap, uh, capitalist is uh, you know, short from. That's where we get metropolis from. So it was uh, Gadara, Damascus, Philadelphia. Uh, there were ten Greek cities where he was actually. He said, "Go and proclaim this in those cities." So this man was basically demon possessed. He was demonized, and Jesus set him free. So this is an amazing story. I mean, if you take this story and look at it. It shows the power that Jesus had and how he um, encountered unclean spirits, which didn't happen in the Old Testament. And we're going to get to that in a minute. So I just want to, want to make a point real quick. Point number one. Yes, there really are demons. Yes. A lot of people say there really aren't demons. A lot of people have their own uh, ideology about where what, what demons really meant back in the biblical days. But yes, there are really demons. And a, a few of you pastors, ministers in here have experienced that. So um, the, the word demon is actually in the New King James Version 82 times. 61 times it's in the gospel where Jesus is actually dealing with them or talking about them. So why is it in the gospel so much? Because no one had authority over them until Jesus came. That's, right. That's why you don't read about it in the Old Testament. So he immediately began to confront and... Uh, Take down strongholds, demonic strongholds when he started his ministry. Um, demons come from fallen angels. One third of the angels fell, which means when you talk about one third of the angels fell, what does that mean? Is that good news or bad news? Here's the good news. That means two thirds still fighting for us. Amen. One third fell. We still got two thirds on our side. So um, people think demons are tough. I mean, Hollywood has, has created these super monsters when it comes to demons. If you've seen movies like The Exorcist or you know, any of these other movies that, that have to deal with demonic possessions or people being you know, just tortured by demons, they're really not that tough. No. Uh, Andrew Womack told us one day about when he was actually getting bitten and beaten up by demons and he ran out to his car, mm -hmm. put his car in reverse, <laughs> about to leave and this Lord stopped him and said, no, do, you, do you believe what I'm telling you or not? He goes, I guess I do. Put it in the drive, pulled up, parked, got out, went back in there and confronted him and got rid of him. People, if you let fear jump on you, everything seems a hundred times worse. That's right. Andrew actually said he saw them. If you could see what they look like, he said you would laugh. People think demons are tough. Listen, they're not that <laughs> tough. And how do I know that? I'll tell you. Revelation 20. He sends one angel That's right. to bind Satan and throw him in the pit. Mm. One angel. So if demon's so all powerful and you know people make it out to be, he sends one angel. You know, he probably says to Gabriel, Gabriel, go take care of my life work for me. <laughs> Gabriel goes, Who do you want to send? And he goes, send him the new guy. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> Demons are disembodied spirits. Disembodied spirits. They are looking for a body. They enter bodies. That's why they wanted to go into the swine when he was going to cast them out. It is hard for them to get a foothold or a stronghold, so they want to be in bodies. Um, not his soul or his spirit, which some people like to say, but it, it's, it's a body that they are looking for. Um, the thing that really confuses me, I guess, is there are demons. The Bible talks about it all those times we mentioned. And a lot of people still don't believe that. A lot of... Uh, Christians believe that there are not demons. So if they're not demons, we're going to have to cut out most of Jesus' teaching. Because as many times as he ministers about healing people and setting them free from demons, I just don't understand how they can line that up. But as we mentioned before, you know, 81% of all first-year theologians at college, Bible college, don't believe there's a heaven or hell. So it kind of makes sense. Okay, so real quick, I'm going to show you some verses, uh, what the Bible says about demons. Uh, Matthew, 8, Matthew 8, 16. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. Matthew 9, 32, 33. As they went out, behold, they brought him a man, mute and demon-possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke, and the multitude spoke, and said it was never seen like this in Israel. Matthew 17, 18. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Mark 3, 14, 15. Then he appointed 12 that they might be with him 
that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and cast out demons. Mark 6, 12 through 13, and they cast out many demons, anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Mark 16, 17, and these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons and they will speak with new tongues. Amen. Amen. So, you believe the Bible or, or do you not? Yes. Yes. Are you one of those that pick and choose the verses that you like? No. no. So, this, these kind of questions, these things you might encounter as you're ministering to people. Okay? Um, C.S. Lewis. You want to know C.S. Lewis? Oh. Great Christian uh, apologist. He wrote, you know, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. That was, you know, probably know that. Uh, he says there's two groups of people that Satan absolutely loves and gets excited about. The skeptics and the superstitious. Satan absolutely loves those two because there's people that see a demon behind every bush. Yeah, that's right. And there's people that say that they do not exist or only existed during Jesus' time. So you see which ditch they're in, right? Yeah. Yeah. Satan loves those types. This is a quote. Satan loves both those types because they are both in bondage and deception. Some people, as a pastor, as a minister, they'll, they'll say, you know what, pastor, let's not talk about demons. That gives me the will. Other people will say, oh, awesome, let's talk about that, I like that. Listen, if you're in either one of those camps, you need to move to the middle. That's right. Because you are, it, you could possibly be falling into a trap, and I've done that before. I was talking to Dana and Scott about that earlier, where I had a book that was called, He Came to Set the Captives Free. And I had a picture of holding their hands up with a chain, and there was a, a holy sword breaking that chain. And... I read the book and started talking about how demons and, and witches could put curses and, you know, how the Lord would, you know, get you out of that. But fear jumped on me. And I started having nightmares. Some of the worst nightmares I've ever had in my life. And I, and I woke up and I couldn't rest. I couldn't sleep. Something was not right. And I went and got that book and I threw it away and it stopped. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, you know, I said, Father, forgive me for opening my eyes to that stuff. And I was letting that stuff in my eyes. Putting it in my mind. Which was dropping down in my heart. So, so we need to be careful for that. Which book do we need to be reading about demons? The Bible. About how to deal with demons. And, and so when you get this knowledge, you have this knowledge, it's in your arsenal, but we don't need to dwell on it. Focus on that. And get in one of those ditches where we're excited about talking about it or, or saying that they don't exist. All right? The one thing I want to stress tonight is you will never get free of bondage if you don't know that you are in bondage. And the reason I say that is because some of those questions that were asked us saying, I'm saved, I cannot be in bondage. Listen, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Um, you want to know who Jack Hayford is? Yes. Okay. Jack Hayford says, you can't cast out the flesh and you can't disciple a demon. <laughs> so... In other words, there are people that, will, that people will say, it's just the flesh, you need to overcome it. Right. And then other people will say, you need more discipline, and this discipline is where we get the word disciple. So, uh, you have, and others will say, you have a demon, and you need deliverance. So do we need discipleship or deliverance? Yes. I mean, both. So, every sickness isn't caused by a demon. Okay. That's right. Every every everything going wrong in your life isn't caused by a demon. That's, That's right. right. But there are some that are. That's right. yeah. Okay? And so that's where as a body, as a family, we get with each other, we pray with each other, we have discernment. <coughs> and we can discern what's going on. We can look at things, we can talk about things together, and that's where we help each other. That's right. That's why you should not forsake the assembly. Thank that's you. where we have to get together on Wednesdays. And Fridays and Saturdays yes, and, and Sundays. So we get together. You'll catch some of that if it's real good, right? Okay. Anyone knows? Anyone know who Pastor Derek Prince is? Yes. Okay. I was listening to one of his testimonies, and he had been he really worked heavily in supernatural as far as dealing with demonic spirits and and, and getting people free of those type of things. And he was forty years into his ministry. And he went to the doctor, and um, he got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So one of the, uh, you know, he, he lived in England at the time. Or actually, he was in India living with his daughter. And uh, one of the lowest-ranking members of the uh, Episcopalian church 
uh, and I forget the title they give him, sent, I think the church sent him over to, to pray with him. So he showed up and he says, uh, he goes, Pastor, would you mind if I prayed with you about, you know, this diagnosis? And he goes, she goes, sure, why not? So he laid hands on him and began praying with him. And, and, and Derek Prince said that as soon as he laid hands on him, he felt like there were cats fighting in his chest. That's the only way he could describe it, like there were cats fighting in his chest. And so he said when he realized that, he looked down, he let out the most loud roar you've ever heard in your life. And a spirit left. Mm-hmm. Now this is Derek Prince who had been over 40 years Amen. casting out demons, working on those type of things. So someone that's been in the ministry that long, yes. if they're able to have be under attack like that, there was a crack somewhere. There was a door, there's a window that's cracked. Okay? One of my favorite, Pastor Robert Morris, Amen. was married, a youth pastor, counseling, and uh, traveling, evangelizing. Yes. When he was uh, delivered from a whole bunch of uh, demonic spirits, lust. He couldn't. He said he could not teach a service without looking at. He had noticed a beautiful lady in the audience, and lust would just fill his mind. And he said when he got with uh, James Robinson, he sat down one day and he said they were talking, and uh, he, James Robinson started reading verse after verse like we're doing today about demonic spirits. And he said, he goes, wait, 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 wait. He, he said he remembered because he was eating ice cream. <laughs> and he said, you mean to tell me you think I have demons? Because, oh, you've got a whole flock of mm-hmm. And she goes, <laughs> so the thing is, he said, don't be ashamed. Don't, don't be fearful. Don't be anything about that. He said, the thing is, he goes, we have victory over that. Yes. But once you acknowledge you have a stronghold or a bondage, we can get rid of that. We can take care of it. Like we did last time when we relieved all that anger and hatred and bitterness that we had in us. So that's what we're going to talk about. Point number two. Yes, they really do enter people. John 10 verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold. Now, what does the sheepfold represent? That's where the sheep are, right? The believers. He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way. The same as a thief and a robber. Now, who's a thief? Satan. Satan. He's a robber. Satan. He's saying the thief can get in. That's right. If he can't come through the pastor, he will find some other way to get into the sheepfold. Yeah. He'll do everything he can to get to the sheep. A lot of people misquote John 10.10. 10. Uh, they say uh, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But the actual, now, depending on which translation you have, it says the thief does not come except... except to steal, kill, and destroy. So what does that mean? That means the only reason he's coming is to steal from you, to kill, to destroy you. Yes. That's the only reason. And he'll find any way he can to get in. So can a Christian be demon-possessed? Now, we have to look at the meaning. We have to look at the meaning, what that means to be demon-possessed. So to me, a better translation would be demonized. Someone's demonized, like the guy we were reading about in Mark 5 was demonized. He had over 6,000 demons in him. All right? Uh, demon possession or demon possessed is okay, but the problem is we were never taught correctly what possession means. All right? Uh, there are two Greek words for possession that, that's used here in the Bible. One is ownership. This is not the word used for ownership. Okay? The uh, demon possessed in Greek is actually two words. Daemoni, zomai. Daemoni, zomai. Daemoni means demon. Zomai means to possess. And this is not the word for ownership. Um, the word that's actually used means to gain mastery over or to be in control of. Some synonyms to gain control, to have power over. Um, the Greek word that's used here, zomai, is actually used in Luke 21 19, which says, By your patience, possess your souls. All right. Now, Jesus wouldn't be saying own your souls because he said, you know, we have to give our souls to him. Right. So the Bible says that you are bought with a price, right? You are not your own. You don't even belong to you. And he's saying basically to gain mastery of your soul. And that's what the word possess means. All right. So can a Christian be owned by a demon? No, absolutely not. We are owned by God. But can a Christian be under the control of a demon? 
So let me read you a couple definitions real quick. Thayer's definition of daemonizomai is to be under the power of a demon. Now this is defining daemonizomai. To be under the power, under the mastery, under the control of a demon in a certain area of your life. In a certain area of your life. So, lust, unforgiveness, bitterness, uh, gluttony, whatever it is. That's where you can be under the control if you can't seem to stop. You can't seem to get it out of your life. You've prayed about it. You've prayed about it. You said, I'm not going to do it again. That's where you are under control. That's a stronghold. That's a bondage. Okay? So let me ask you that. Is there any area of your life that you cannot seem to get control over? You say over and over. You're like, uh, you, you've confessed your sins. You've confessed it over and 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 over, and you still can't stop. You still can't get rid of it. Anybody? Listen, that's bondage. That's exactly what that is. You cannot seem to get rid of it. Some people say, oh, that's just a weakness in my life. It's not a weakness. You've been doing it for 20 years. Okay? <laughs> that's bondage. <clears throat> so let me give you an illustration real quick. Let's say if you left today, Evans, let's say you guys left today. You left the window open. Or you left your door open or you left it unlocked. And when you go home, you find a thief in your house. So let me ask you this. Uh, does that thief own your house? No. 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 But he's in your house. Right? And he has control over your house. Until you arrest him and take him out with handcuffs. So he doesn't own your house, but he's in your house. And he has control over it. Right? While he's in there, he's going to steal, kill, and destroy. Right? Right? So he's a thief and he's in your house. So I'm going to show you some old, some shadows and types in the Old Testament. Uh, Lamentations 1.10. The adversary has spread his hand over all her pleasant things, for she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary. Those whom you commanded not to enter your assembly, but they did. Lamentations 4.12. The kings of the earth and all inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. And these are types, all right? Joel 2.9. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. So let me ask you this. If a man, a believer, filled with the Holy Spirit, if he drinks a lot of alcohol or takes a lot of drugs, um, do the drugs or alcohol own his body? No. He's still owned by God. Are they in him? Yes. Is he under the influence of those things in his body? Yes. Yes. So, listen closely now. This is important. If that person, if it's a man or a woman who's a Christian, ends up doing something totally out of character that they're very ashamed of later, if they look at pornography, so say on the internet, something flashes up, you just open a door. You just open a crack. Pornography is a huge problem right now in our society. You're opening a door to the enemy, and he will come in. Yes. He will come in. You'll be under his influence. You'll be under his power. Um, this person could be a spouse, could be a, a, a grandparent, could be an elder in the church. It could be anything. They'll end up doing something completely out of character that shocks everybody. Including themselves. They opened up a door. Now, if you're starting to get upset, depressed, or whatever, you're thinking, crap. You're looking at me. Here's the deal listen, we have freedom. That's right. We have victory. We have to understand yes, maybe I have some bondage in this area. And I love this because when we talk about stuff, I don't talk, I don't just randomly pick something. The Holy Spirit talks to me and says, I want to talk about this. And I'm just being obedient. Amen. And if it's one of you or all of you, I, listen, this is for you, whoever needs this tonight. There's no nothing to be ashamed about. This is family. This is where we come together. And we get, we, we get to leave here better than we came. Amen. Thanks to Jesus. Thank so point number three, yes, Jesus really does cast them out. Luke 10, 17. And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. 
And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. Now listen, that's ty types and shadows. That's not snakes and stinging things, all right? And, all, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. Now notice, the spirits are subject to us. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Yes. 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 In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father. Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent. People that think they're smarter than everybody else. Come on. People that think there are no demons. There are none of this. We've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Amen. So, notice. He says, Father, thank you that you've hidden these things. What were they talking about? They were talking about authority over demons. He said, God, I, th I know, God, that the smart ones think there are no demons, but these precious babes, these young believers, they know, they saw it, they understand that. That's right. And I thank you for that. The spirits are subject in his name. Amen. Okay, so if you're starting to feel like i got a problem in this area, you know, anything like that, and I want you to feel bad about it. I want to show you something. One more thing. See, we don't have a problem knowing God has power. What the enemy focuses on is our weaknesses and our history. Amen. Saying, you can't get free. They can get free, but you can't get free. You know, these lies that come into your mind. Anyone, you know, they can do that, but they're not as bad as you. That's what he'll do. He'll lie to you every time. So, I want to remind you in Mark 5, that this man was demonized. He had over 6,000 demons. He lived naked in the cemetery. Right? None of you are as, as in bondage as this guy. You all have your clothes on still, so that's good. <laughs> I want to show you something. Verse 6. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. Now listen. Satan does not have the power to stop you from coming to Jesus. Amen. If he did, this guy had 6,000 demons in him. If he could have stopped anyone, he could have stopped him. He ran when he first saw him and got proskuneo. He got on the ground, fell on his face, and worshipped Jesus. So he does not have the power to stop you from worshipping and running to Jesus, which is what we need to do when we have problems is run to Jesus. Amen. 